Well, thank you. Thank you, Clarence. Um, thank you, Sang. Thank you, everyone here at Eastside Freedom Library. And for everyone here, it's awesome to be to share space with you tonight. It's kind of, I don't know, it's it's crazy, but it's it's so nice. I don't know. It's like a winter wonderland. Um, right, sort of. <laughs> um, well, it's a real honor to be here uh with everyone and Tongo. Wow. Um uh, just as a longtime San Francisco resident before coming to Minnesota, this just feels extra special. Um, so welcome to the Twin Cities. And I'm just going to read a poem from Bodega um, titled American Seismology, Queensbridge, Queensbridge Projects, New York City, 1989. In the hall of our store with an elevated counter, I watched my mother rock away hours. The hawk weaves a braided hair water guns, gold chains, knickerbocker wares, AAA batteries behind bulletproof glass, walls outfitted with fake designer apparel. As my father duplicated skylines of brass keys, the machine's timber rising above the base of souped up cars. I manned the rusty cash register during summer breaks. We three waking at dawn to, to make the trek below the bridge where struts and trusses lanced shadows across the East River, high rises towering like distant mountain ranges. Out front, prides of wise men lingered on milk crates to rattle the day's news, rolling loose tobacco against limp dollar bills, while children chased on worn astroturf lawns behind wrought iron palisades with nowhere else to play. Hulking concrete monsters lurked above, their curtained eyes, barbed teeth, ready to devour heads, eviscerate, incarcerate. As women, young and old, sat on nearby stoops to escape the heat, siren heat, humming aged psalms, they cradled cooing newborns to their chests. Please, Lord, have mercy. As bands of white rookie cops circled a five block radius, hitting their nightsticks against accordion metal fences, memorizing faces to incarcerate, eviscerate. I'd count down the minutes till six o'clock when my parents switched off the lights, taking stock of these terrible hierarchies, wages stuffed into the lining of their pants while I idled in the car as they locked up the engine running. Thank you.
Not much heaven, though. Here's a man before a fight. A leave me alone type character. Emerging from the penniless death of a one-way street fiction. A fancy way of saying I'm gonna make it even if I have to drive backwards. All I have is chord changes and a thousand backhand. Driving the street like I'm choking it, car full of nephews. Hasn't been a sun since November and there hasn't been a street I can't choke to death. This city better back down. You see this gun on the table? There's something about staring until it off your stable. Why wouldn't I protect everyone? All my death sleep late. My son better be quick. My daughter better shoot first because we fall for no one. We fall for nothing. Okay, the first thing you'll feel is the heat. It's like, well, tell me, trying to tell me about possession. Drink life neat is what I mostly hear. Most of the world leaves me alone. To breathe smog like a giant, to go to jail every once in a while when the genocide kicks up in late May. When politicians have too easy a time, I'm guessing backwards out of one-way street in honor of myself. And in honor of you, if you understand the nature of the world. How long I've been just like my father? Well, hell of a resemblance, says the anxiety of the neighborhood. This is a crossroads or a crossroads narrative. But so much crossroads, people get in the habit of turning back. Turn back only to find themselves remembering me, but not my last words. A man before a fight, you feel the heat. But there's nothing to keep in mind. There's nothing to remember. Really, there's nothing to be. It's just this moment, then another, then stare, then it all becomes stable, then the table lets go fuzzy, and Friday's an unfamiliar face peeking in the window. It's cool to panic for a second. Composure is wasted on your worst enemies. People are marked on that sidewalk. You're the only thing life size. Everybody knows it's in a wire hanger empire. When the blood stops walking, that feeling isn't father enough to be permission to fold. You better swing one more time. You know that father of yours rose from the grave and said, just give me five more minutes. He said, running water is a myth. It's us who are running up, down, all alongside this water. And people don't rise from the grave. They not laid down neither. It's us who flip all around their body. So where, beware when the people around you all look like they about to jump, it might be your time. You feel the heat. And when four walls demand to be four walls and the earth outside, muse don't panic. Don't try to recreate the earth outside. Don't tell jokes to yourself. Don't even talk disrespectfully to the four walls. Instead, unclench your fist and walk away. There might be heaven. If you understand the nature of the world. Yo, from a two-floor skyline, an abandoned house once talked to me. It said, young man, you are heroic and 10 years old. Among 20 generations of friends, your friends will free fall away. They'll free fall up. They'll free fall the walls with fifth grade speed to industrial paint behind secondhand fences. Young man, use quick knife tones. Be bone and brass. Be last laugh music. You're always leaving. Always want to change the clothes from the door of life and escape. The two-floor skyline said you're the guy that dies in the middle. The friend more blues than skin. The face that cheap hotel schizophrenics can place with a 90 mile per hour right eyes among dry heat killers once children three feet high and, and roaming and repeating and aiming at cotton mirrors and hang on breathing walls. You are 10 years old, tagging along, yawning at well-lit violence, whistling tool shop songs. You will be useful. You will be high and alone, flying on a nephew dragon from a $20 family in a sky that calls itself just more soil. Around walls that are just walls, except these walls suggest you make wives out of highs and currency. Here the air is polite to sleepy glass and bullying walls. Young man, you will come to admit that sometimes suicide is power because some people live stronger as ghosts. And sometimes the afterlife empties billions of souls into objects like playground bullets and abandoned door frames. Even broken glass will prove it has voice too. There are 24 hours behind your back. Look over your shoulder right now. Can you hear it? The sound of drums punching themselves out. The sound of piano parts learned in between assassination attempts, be bone and brass, be bone enough for two souls, be invincible again. Suffer red-eyed accents, professional fingertips, gifted victim, six in the morning beer, the first month of probation, the shot at the wall, see these, see these words that shouldn't be home. Look behind you again, be invincible again, be windward, be a sad machete, be her son, be a thief, still his back left too long and never look away. The afterlife will empty and walk you home. I go to the railroad tracks and follow them to the station of my enemies. 
A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative all over the United States. There are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big Cosby basket and why blood, me, blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho spiritual refusal to write white history to take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm. Ricochet so is near where I collapsed into a rat infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti. In the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up. House of God in part, no cops in part. My body brings down to Christmas. The new bullets pray over blankets made from the old bullets. Pray over the 28th hour's next beauty mark. Extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration. The waistband before the next protest post. Hey, by the way, time is not an illusion, your honor. I will save your desk for last. You're a witty, your honor. You're moving money again, your honor. It's only raining one thing. Now white cops and prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk floating on the oil spill. A neighborhood making a lot of fuss over his demise a new lake for a Black Panther party. Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder, the figment of village, a new noose to a new white preacher. All in that fact painting for president. Bought slavery some time, didn't it? The tattoo screeches of military boats and election Tuesday cars, a cold-blooded study in leg irons, proof that some white people have actually found them nooses. That sundown couples made their vows of love over opaque peach plastic. And boat action audiences, the mega ever second, definitely my favorite law of science. Final news clippings and primitive Methodists, my arm changes imperialisms. Simple policing versus structural frenzies. Elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums. Artless bleeding in the challenge of watching civilians think. Terrible rituals they have around the corner. They let their elders beg for public mercy. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads and their arrows myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest. Modern fans, oh, what, 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 what they? T-shirt poems and T-shirt guilt and me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on the bus. I have no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. You know, apparently too much of San Francisco was not there in the first place. This dream requires more condemned Africans to put another way state violence rises down or Still, life is just getting warmed up, or army life is looking for a new church and ignored all other suggestions, or folk tale writers have not made up their minds as to who is going to be their friends. You know, this is the worst downtown yet, and I've borrowed a cigarette everywhere. I've taken many a walk to the back of a bus, that lit on out the back of a storyteller's prison sentence, then on out the back of slave scars, but this is my comeback face. I left my watch on the public bathroom sink and took the toilet with me, threw it at the first bus I saw eating single mothers half alive. It flew through the bus line numbered and on out the front of the White House. Hey, hopefully you find comfort downtown. But if not, we brought you enough cigarette filters to make a decent winter coat, a special species of handshake. Let's all know who's king and what's the lifespan of uniform cloth. This coffin needs to quit acting like those are birds singing. Rusty nails have no wings, have no voice other than that of a white world down there. Book pages in the gas pump. Hey, catchy, isn't it? The way three nooses is the rule, or the way potato sack masks go so well with radio codes, or the way condemned Africans fought their way back to the ocean, only to find waves made of 1920s burnt up piano parts, European backdoor deals and red flowers for widows who spent all day in the sun mumbling in San Francisco. Red flowers, but what's the color of a doctor visit? There are book titles in the streets. Book titles like, hero, you'd make a better zero. Or, hey, fur coat lady, the president is dead. Or, pay me back in children. Or, they hung up their bodies in their own museums. And other book titles pulled from a drum solo. Run here, hero. Lied to hiding place. All the bullets in 10 precincts know where to go. There's no heaven on the other good idea in the sky. Politics means that people did it and people do it. Understand that when in San Francisco and other places that was never really there. I bet this ocean thinks it's an ocean, but it's not. It's just Sixth Dimension Street. I don't know who's king. <laughs> king of thin things, you know. <clears throat> like America, I'm proud to deserve to die. I'm going to eat my dinner extra slow tonight in this police state candy dispenser you all call the neighborhood. No set of manners goes unpunished. Never mind a murderer's insomnia or the tea kettle preparing everyone for police sirens. These little societies, they wander together like hopeful drops of a virus. Citizen testaments bent on offering me a nation of breadwinners to hold me back like it's a Brinks. I wrinkle the concrete sometimes like flesh. My Martin Luther King permanence turned away from a podium into the reeds like God is the dangerous twin. Black August to the mountaintop, balcony on my bedroom floor. You know, they steal you from the earth itself and suspend you in your broken neck from their fullest euphoria, from the loyalty out of their great superstition, loyalty out of their agrarian reform. I return to my mother completely disrespected, fulfilling the heat off of purgatory. They kill poets like me. Walk me away from my poems, never to be heard from again in this final industrial complex. 
or bad lines picked off or picked through a sporting spiritual death or your devil at least half made, please become a pretty word. I'm reading them in my shoestrings like they were tea leaves, teaching you how to write about cities. It's the 25th century in the mirror, people. Tyranny against your chump change, you're a chump to be mocked even with a gun in your car. A cupid of needlework spelled tune for the proletariat, the relapse ministry. Talented people curled up in a fetal position next to a diamond dime. Just another service day in the theatrics of tea house fascism, in the bouquet of surveillance cameras, in the poverty of God. New blue eyes, corpses of water, um, a newly potted presidency, and one big shiny coin if you ask an animate capitalism, another nine literal boys, killing his white freedom. The deification of hyphens, medicine, bread, and picture shows, great protesters in LA, guests of our ink, drop kicking Rose in the grave. I mean, this DC mink like a stone torn in half, the pen advances, despite CIA guideposts, despite non African past and futures, a metaphorical but not surreal day in a horn ridden life, horn player improvising king, like a, um, a radio prize fight featuring Shango himself. A real hand sweeps the land of racism. May I return to the ground? May I make progress with the gun? On our mother Emmanuel, they put on music that evening. A swinging type body language for you to drink with fermented $5 bills. For your body language, some applause. My past stomach line ain't either a good thing nor a bad thing, like being psychic on the way to a lethal injection. It'll sit you down with Lady Day. Lady Day leading you to surrender their souls to Africa too soon. Polly thought floating in a cup of water, she saved me. Accessing my stomach, accessing the love of the American lynch. Cold sleeves wood and avalanche into the wrist. Our mother Emmanuel, avalanche into the sharp keys. Pain. The deal you make with pain. A piano makes sense for them. Laying hands on the world gradually. Addressing the bend the necks on the streets of the north. Traveling sailing in pain. Repeating pain in the north. Ten trigger fingers on that piano if harmony would have me. Putting a hundred fights on every direction offered her. Lady Day. leaning on trees again. Recruiting the countryside itself. Lay a plan on this lightning. Make your pause the corner pocket of men. I'll grieve the bruise itself. America may clean my dead body, but will never include me. There goes the poet. Killing without killing. Never mind this painting of your language. May I be a meaningful lynching? A crow's passing. Good and dead by the afternoon. <laughs> Well, yeah, I I just want to let uh, let that have some space and um, thank you for that, Tongo. It, so many thoughts come to mind for me just listening to uh, that poem. As you were reading, I was thinking like, I know why we're in person now. Like, <laughs> it translates, um, but there's something about being present here. Uh, with you as you share that. I, I'm thinking about embodying the work, being physically present in the work. Um, I, I I don't work from memorization. I, the poem I read tonight, I don't know how many times I've read it, but uh, and I don't know if the book is a safety blanket or uh, or what, but I just was thinking a lot about how important it is to be physically present in the work that we make and wondered if you could speak on that a little bit. It it um for me it's it's uh putting the poem in my head is the best way uh is the best way for actually selfishly <laughs> it's the best way for me to experience the poem so that I'm not so that I can just um, relax into the various realities of the poems and the 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 kind of in, in inherent energy and not perform the situation ironically you know it, or you know it, it may because it seems very performative but it's really uh when i have a paper in front of me then i feel like okay i am a poet and i am here to say some poems <laughs> for people and you know, this whereas you know i can move more internally <laughs> without the without the without the uh book in, in my hand and then there, there's also a, um there is a you know there is kind of an opportunity when you get a poem 
almost down to a muscle memory, then I have access to more, um, not powers, but just I have more sensitivities or I can access more sensitivities as I'm going that keeps me kind of, uh, that keeps me, uh, gives me an ability to do better by the lines, line for line as I move along, to do better by the words, to get just really sensitive to what this stanza is saying or what this stanza could possibly say and how this little energy I might be feeling in the moment can animate that stanza in a very singular way, in a way that they've never combined before, you know. So it just, it, it without without um, the, almost like the, not, just for me, without the, what's a distraction uh, or a, a, almost the preoccupation of reading, um, I can just, I can really get down more into the molecules of a poem and, and see what, um, see what I can express. I mean, uh, wow, thank you, Tongo. Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, funny, funny, haha. but right before we started, we were just talking about nerves and I asked you if you get nervous because I was, I was very nervous and I'm still very nervous and it's, it changes. It d depends on the event or, or whatnot. Um, but I had in preparation for tonight, I had watched uh, several of your readings on YouTube um, and I could already tell tonight was different in the way that you read these poems than um, the, the other readings that I saw you at. And it was, it was very clear that, yeah, you were definitely channeling or embodying a different energy tonight. Um, can you talk about, I mean, I, we both know kind of why, you know, what brings you to the Twin Cities and um, on this occasion and, um, and sort of what are some of the energies that are, you're dealing with right now that sort of you channel tonight in that reading? Uh, yeah. So uh, a year ago, uh, my cousin AJ Stewart was killed by a white supremacist in, in St. Paul. Uh, so I'm here. Uh, Just to, several blocks from here, right? I mean, right, not too far from not even too the far library from here. here. Yep, yep, in East East St. Paul, and uh, and so you know, we I'm here to help advance organizing efforts that already uh, been been underway. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely present, but also, you know, his, his mother is here, right, right there. And, um, you know, uh, it, the mission, the we're mission. So, we're so sorry for, for your loss. I mean, it's, it's the fact that it hasn't made, I don't know, there's, there, there's just hasn't been any sort of justice for what happened to AJ. Yeah. Um, could we talk a little bit more about the case a little bit, yeah, whatever you're sure. comfortable with? Um, yeah, I, I was just, I was just go uh, in, in, in kind of conclusion though to the, um, to the answer, uh, uh, um, what kind of the energy of the mission got what became really to give her some joy, you know what I mean? Um, and so that's, that's, that I, I actually felt pretty, pretty light <laughs> as, as we was moving along. Uh, but, um, what 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 was the specifics of the case you was interested in? Just the lack of justice that we've so, I mean in the last right. year, you know. Um, sadly, I mean, you know, Minnesota is not uh, uh, a stranger to these sort of violences, um, yeah. and I feel like your cousin's case hasn't really reached a level of awareness right. um, here. And, and and that's and that's what we're that's 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 what we're trying to build. Um, and, and awareness and, and also, um, you know, you, yeah, I understand like, I, I, I wager for all, uh, kind of murder, uh, especially murder of black people, a million people, later. <laughs> uh, uh, millions of people later, there's no real justice that could restore anything. You know what I mean? The loss of a loved one, especially to some white supremacist violence, where basically this cat stabbed him in the heart for parking in, in his in front of his house. So when someone gets taken away um, on, on the, the 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 whim 
of somebody psychotic or somebody who has normalized the psychotic psyche, um, it's actually an expanding hole. It's a hole that that gets opened every day and how crucial, you know, AJ was to the family, right? Um, so unless they figure out, unless we can kill him every day, <laughs> there's no justice we can get out this white dude. So what what we what we uh, what we can do though is uh, is not a, a kind of a justice for AJ, but a unity for AJ, and, and start putting together the kind of the necessary unity or the people power um, to prevent you know um, these things from happening. And ultimately, we know the the only way to guarantee uh, prevention of this type of violence is a complete transformation of the system itself. So this is what, you know, this is a major, the, the main point of our, of our organizing is to create, you know, the, the conditions for really for a, a, a revolutionary change, you know. There's one moment in the poem where you you were leading into it, talking about a different kind of death, about suicide, but you said some people live stronger as ghosts. And in that moment, I actually wrote down. <laughs> yeah. I, in that moment, I was just thinking about what it takes to be seen and honored and appreciated for your gifts and contributions and how hard it is for some people to to achieve that kind of dignity and respect in their life. Um, I, I just wondered if you could speak on that a little bit too. Well, it's, you know, the, the, the thing about this little settler uh, colonial project is, well, this this life is no life at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and uh, our, our kind of in, individual adventures um, don't guarantee a humanization for us or others. And so coming to terms uh, with uh, the fact that you actually, uh, that we were kind of born to a, not to be dramatic, but we we're born to a, a social death, right? We're, we're born to a, a social death in, in, in the only certain aspects of us um, of ourselves will, will be incorporated, whether that's, you know, nine times out of 10, whatever little labor you can provide, or as Black people, the target you can provide this uh, settler colonial um, project. So, you know, for us, uh, uh, you know, death is... Um, Death is just another wall in the another wall in the room. It's it's a, a kind of a a, a natural. Um, in a way, it's just it's it's an it's it's the it's the environment, right? Um, it's the ruling class's intention where the poet kind of enters. Interestingly, or those who kind of just have a sensitivity to a certain phenomena. It is it's it's also there it's it's therefore um a protagonist uh to to take along with you on this on this uh struggle um on this struggle for for liberation thinking about the the three of us are literary artists um and, and there's one part of me that just thinks that everybody brings their gifts forward toward uh, liberation, toward undoing the settler colonial project. Um, I'm often asked, and I, I think I, independently, I often wonder, is art enough? Is art the right answer? Going back to another line in the poem, there goes the poet, killing without killing. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a line that, allows for a lot of, I don't know, a lot of responses, a, a lot of reactions. It, 
a lot of interpretations and I'm not asking you to, to diagram it out for us, but I wanted to just share that I resonate with that. And it also makes me think about the role of the artist in the community. Um, I know for you that shows up in a lot of ways. Uh, there's the Poet Laureate title, which is, um, I think it's helpful in promoting poetry and um, allows for a platform from which some good things to be done. And then there's also like the actual work of being out in the community, um, really organizing and and agitating for change. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about all the different ways you, you kind of bring your art forward in that effort. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's a it's it's something that we all you know. It's almost like the um, the mission is to codify that and and make that program or make that praxis because it is poetry is the right answer, but poetry is not enough, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, a, a groovy. I think it was uh, in Sister Outsider. Uh, Audre Lord said that uh, the poem is almost the uh, the 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 kind of like a, a foundation for a new internalized liberation um, that your mind might not be able to handle. It's like the first step in 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 building a, a piece of of consciousness right so if i was to you know task you with imagining a transform <laughs> you know uh, a society you might not know where to start but the poet can kind of provide those almost embryonic shapes you know and actually coltrane said the same thing uh, in, or, or to paraphrase coltrane said the same thing that music provides these kind of shapes, these new shapes that thought can um, can then kind of build on top of, be built on top of. Um, but ultimately, at this point in history, um, we see that uh, the, 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 the biosphere will not survive uh, if, if we don't all drop our individual ambition and pick up this kind of collective um, praxis, especially, I mean, you see the the kind of the right word, really fascist march that the whole world has, has actually taken, that these empires or imperialist powers would save their capitalism with, would save their capitalism with the double down on the most um, violent, tendencies um within them um re re resistance more and more is the uh you know really is almost the only logical thing to do because it's really it's really only a matter of time you know before one of yours is next or you are next this is just facts you know what i mean um and so at this point, it's almost a, a self-interest. It'd be in, in our self, in, in our best interest, to uh, set our minds to really transform and uh, you know to really resolve any so the social contradiction um, uh, of this society. And we see also selfishly those of us cultural workers actually do better when we when we give our talents to this kind of praxis so we look at like what's one of the greatest educators we could all think like now if i said who's the best <laughs> one of the best we'd all say paulo Freire, or a lot of us would say that well he was just a cat that said everything is either the practice of slavery or the practice of liberation and coming to terms with that well practice of liberation now the classroom looks different the curriculum look different and even how teacher and student relate looks different similarly if we come to the terms that art, the facilitation of art is either going to be the practice of slavery or the practice of liberation, regardless of how sly this little room, because we're the most manipulate manipulatable of uh, <laughs> of all of the of all of the noble profession people, right? 
because they say, oh, look, come to our institution and say whatever you want, right? You don't have to, you know, you can you you can come up here and say, fuck America and this, that, and, you know, and and <laughs> I'm not going to go too far down that skit. You know what I mean? I'm not going to go down too far down that improv, right? But you can say, you, you can say whatever, you can come here and say whatever you want, but all the while, while you're doing this, while you're there, you're really helping the ruling class reproduce its legitimacy, right? And we sit here like, oh, okay, I'm cool, but you know, I'm, I'm talented, but I'm not really doing something until I'm published here or performing here or have or have this have this type of title. So the bourgeoisie survives by our really our our, our um what, what becomes a, a kind of a class inhibition. Right, and an unwillingness to come to terms with like, okay, now nah, my survival and the survival of this here ruling class can't coexist. Or absolute stand in absolute contradiction, right? So in coming to terms with the reality of how this society really is set up and what makes it move in, in, in shape, now we can really see really what what poetry really is 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 uh you know almost like is intrinsic in it which is just minds moving outside of social convention and that's good news for because we need minds outside of social convention because this so these set of social conventions are deadly right so if there was any a society that need liberation poets is this one if there was ever a time in history right um so you know but all again, like all, you know, this is a this is our day almost this is our daily project. Not really or or nothing to, you know, it's, it's, this is just a, this is our journey. It's not necessarily like, okay, let's get to a conclusion as quickly as possible. Let's figure out every day how we can be instruments of liberation. And oftentimes that that comes down to just doing the boring work like in conclusion i forget i forget what the famous poet said this poet famous poet said the problem with being a poet is figuring out what to do with the other 23 hours of the day <laughs> you know what I mean? right. so so you got we got plenty we got plenty of time <laughs> you know we're we gonna find that one out but we got we got uh man somebody please in the internet man get us that but but we have we 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 have we have downtime, which can be used to um to uh you know to to give ourselves even to a process that might be outside of our comfort zone. Because you know, for me it might not be the most comfortable thing to go knock on doors and stuff like that. It might not be the most comfortable thing that like I can't like what we do on the mic, I can't do nothing like that anywhere else. But instead of pursuing the, the never ending, you know, it's just this society always promote, wants us to just be as big and bad as we possibly can be and just stay where you big and bad and instead of going where it's necessary for liberation, you know. And with that in mind, really, I, I, I mean, you know, like uh, the late uh, Terry Collins, who was a Black Panther, one of the leader, leaders of the San Francisco State uh, strike, um, he used to always come and he used to be like, you know, Ho Chi Minh was a poet. Che Guevara was a poet. He had a whole list. I can't even run it all down. Rest in peace, Terry Collins. But yeah, it's 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 uh it's actually within our birthright. Pablo Neruda was a poet. Um, I I had a workshop with Natalie Diaz once, and she spoke on um after her first book came out, getting invitations from universities to come speak and understanding the context for all of that what their motivations were. Um, there are financial incentives connected to all of that. Um, there's the pressure to take care of the rent and take care of your family and get yourself set up and maybe even have more time in the day, uh, you know, after that one hour to, um, yeah, to, to do the work of the poet. Man, but at some point, man, you got to just go ahead and you got to just go ahead and say, fuck it. You know what I mean? At some point, man, somebody got to just say, you know what, man? It might be better for all of us to starve, man, than to, than to let this status quo 
uh, keep going. I be in the same. Lord knows, I, I I have the same problems and 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 the same preoccupations. And being broke is like a whole emotion in itself. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's rough, and when you got families to provide for, and you in this psychotic system that will kill you if you cannot provide. It's literally like it's provide or die. I, I man, I, I understand, but you know, man. It's at at the end of at the end of the day, we have to divorce. We have to divorce our minds from these mandates, and we can pull a lot more off cooperatively. You know, if you know, there's there's a lot of aspects of life that if we were to move together, we would be able to provide for each other while we under, under, undertake this. And unfortunately, too, we also have to come to terms with the fact that it also is not just uh, economic survival that a lot of us are chasing. We're also chasing the survival of some kind of social image we've created for ourselves, some kind of so social reproduction, you know, because I had the same poems in the exact same poems I was writing at a kitchen table in Mississippi when nobody knew anything or nothing. It was the same poems. It was the same energy. So I have to like, you know, have to admit, well, what do I really need now? What, 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 what was, the, was these group, were these groovy kind of individual walks actually necessary for my craft? You know, if the answer is no, then well, okay. What, you know, what, what in my praxis do I have to do to pick up the, pick up the slack well and speaking of survival you're born and raised in san francisco and um shout out to my preschool teacher oh, right there. that was so amazing yeah. when she came up before the reading oh my gosh that was that was amazing um and we were just speaking about survive you know uh having said that i wanted to go back to san francisco after uh, finishing grad school here, but just couldn't afford to go back uh, as a poet or as just anyone really uh, who doesn't work like a crazy expense, you know, high paying, high tech job or or whatnot. And um, San Francisco comes up a lot in your poetry and uh, it's obviously you're a home place, home place of home, but it's almost takes on a, it becomes a character too. And um, I read that you, you know, you refer to San Francisco as a dystopia, uh, where the, even the wealthy seem like they're incarcerated. Um, and then I just recently read a piece in the New York Times about how San Francisco has now the most deserted downtown in any U.S. American city, um, where I think like the occupancy rate is like the lowest it's ever been. Um, and it's I have friends who sort of calling it now sort of a ghost town downtown San Francisco. Um, and so it's sort of becoming what you've said for a long time. Um, how do you, I don't know, how do you feel about being a human in a, in a place where it's just um, so hostile to survival and uh, for anyone really, um, and um, just, just to a select few? And um, I don't know, how, how does that affect your, your poetry, your your just general outlook um well it it, it does uh, I, I mean it, it, it's inter it's an interesting kind of it gives me a kind of a singular musicality because it's a weird it's like the it's a singular kind of uh metaphor uh of, of kind of you know san francisco was a city i mean always in the grips of ruling class bullshit, you know, always been an apartheid town, you know, a lot of the black neighborhoods are literally like, you know, be on the wrong side of the freeway instead of the tracks, you know, um, environmental racism, uh, crazy, discuss I mean, we got cancer clusters right in San Francisco, you have cancer clusters, you have everybody has asthma, you know, um, at the same time, though, you do have a city where um, historically kind of white supremacy was at almost at least like kind of culturally weakest. 
almost aesthetically uh, weakest. And you did have, so you had this kind of assertion of the mass imagination in very groovy ways, you know. You have the woman's building. You have the, uh, the you know, you have this beautiful carnival. You have uh, Fillmore, you know, Harlem of the West and all these like very singular um, kind of uh, cultural uh, landmarks. But now completely, um, you know, co completely gutted by the whims of, you know, of, of uh, of this this kind of this evolution of in, of imperialism or this equation of getting people out of the getting poor people people of color out of the cities and, and and pushing them off in some kind of like Paris or Rio de Janeiro kind of um equation so for me it's all kind of it's all kind of fool because it's like you know I, irony is is what we play with you know what I mean um but I will say though that like you know San Francisco doesn't stand out it doesn't it? never even in 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 not all, any past kind of glory it it never st uh, stood outside of the um the the the, the, the contradictions that rule the rest of the rule the rest of this society and it really all it, and 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 it should only be related to in any kind of uh, only special uh, in a, 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 a specific enough to figure out how to organize it you know um and there's you know it has its own little its, its own little ways but it's not it doesn't stand outside of our historical um task it makes for it makes for some interesting portraits you know i like making fun of it <laughs> But it's ultimately it's the same, you know, mandate no matter. And probably you drop me off anywhere, I'm probably gonna be making fun of it and trying to organize it. You know what I mean? Well, as of 2020, Minnesota ranked second in the nation for worst median income and home ownership gaps between white and black residents, and is 45th out of the 51 states when it comes to racial integration, making it one of the most segregated. Places you know, areas. like like uh, me and Tab was just talking about, a AJ Mother was just talking about, like, this is a sundown town, you know? And it was, yeah, man, don't let me at this city, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I tear this shit up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I think we're done. Are we are we good with sound here? Okay, um, just people are uh, sending in questions, so I want to make sure that we do that. Uh, I want to remind people, uh, Subtext Books is here. Uh, Subtextbooks.com, I believe, is their website. If you want to order books of any of our poets here. Um, I wanted to announce something uh, before I forget and we lose time. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm sure folks here have them, folks online have them. But uh, on Wednesday, the 28th, December 28th at 6.30, Tongo will lead a teach-in on white supremacy and the recent evolution of militias. Since 2016, there, have been, there has been a surge of self-organized and armed neo-Confederate tendencies. We witness the insurrection at the white... Uh, at the White House, but how deep uh, and supported are these in our communities? So 6.30 Wednesday here at the Eastside Freedom Library, if you can join that, that is uh, way cool. Um, uh, I want to make sure to engage the online audience, and there are several questions. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them. Um, I kind of want to jump around, but I feel compelled to do them in order. Uh, I think you've addressed this one already. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say about it, but uh, uh, Chaka Green asks, uh, uh, says, wanted to know what was your inspiration to do what you're doing now? Um, I think that is mostly to Tongo, but probably for the other artists as well. Um, you know, it, it's at this point, I mean, we, you know, art uh, 
movement, you know, revolutionary activity. It's really all just one attempt to be a whole human being to, you know, to reanimate myself and reanimate our people, right? And so it's almost it exists in a space that cooperates with all moods, inspired, uninspired, <laughs> frustrated, uh, uh, sad, depressed, happy, ambivalent. All of these energies really just cooperate with the task um, of humanization. So that's pretty much how I'm, that's, that's pretty much how I move now. Yeah, thanks. I, I, your recitation was amazing. It reminded me of a lot of things, only a little bit more. Uh, I, I you know, Michael, you were part of a, a series that the state colleges put together. Um, and one of them was Hanif Abdurab Kib, who read this amazing thing. I was expecting poetry, and it was poetry, but it was, you know, almost this very precise stream of consciousness and and i think this sort of took it in another slant and into a new level is this amazing montage and it made me remind me of a lot of conversations we have here at the library about you know this idea of empire and colonization and how we undo that and and we do it with scholar activists we do it with artist activists and um and it's hard to lie with that stuff and when when you're up here um there's another question from hetty trip uh i'm gonna try and get through these and maybe uh someone if someone has a question here we could uh throw that in too but um what are your opinions in the ways that uh the reverend martin luther king day is celebrated have your poem uh have you poems that give critical thought to this I mean, I think it's important to mark the day. I think like um, my own attitude is there's no American holiday that isn't complicated and corrupted. Um, I have some concern about set asides, Women's History Month, Black History Month, um, days and months that we claim to lean toward including other stories and experiences. Um, I don't want to speak negatively of Dr. King or his impact, his message, but just honor how in America things become commercialized. Uh, which breakfast will you attend? Um, that kind of thing. I like to think those gatherings have a lot of potential. They can create conversations that can lead to change, but um, it's hard not to have some skepticism about how all of that is managed in America. And I think especially now when so many things are happening, um, you know, Dr. King, thinking about his work in Memphis, what he was organizing for and hoping to accomplish, um, that's very far away from um, what Tonga was describing as and articulating as the settler colonial project. And, and, Sometimes you celebrate King, but not the work. Um, and I feel like that's a pitfall too. Um, this is not me saying let's cancel it, but it's, it is, it is I think, a real opportunity for th us to think about how we do it differently. And, and I, I want, man, it's like my little preoccupation. Right? It's like, I want King back, man. I, <laughs> I want Martin back, man. Martin is ours, <laughs> you know? I want him back. Um, and, and I like I, you know, I, I think, man, it, it needs to be a, a, a day of 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 struggle. You know, you need to spend that day engaged in some kind of struggle to really do right by uh, his memory and 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 also the trajectory that he was uh, stolen from. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have a question here? There are plenty of questions online, so. Uh, don't feel obligated to be the kid in class who answers everything. But um, if, if someone does have something, raise your hand, get my attention. Um, but there, there's several pretty uh, interesting questions here. Um, 
uh, a question from Yasmin Ab Abdi uh, Tango. How do you process whatever feelings, including any emotional costs or wearing down that may occur after repeated readings when you embody the strong feelings you speak on uh, and illuminate, uh, illuminate us for the listeners on the topic uh, with this kind of heaviness, complexity, and nuance? <laughs> uh, man, by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> uh, every day is a gamble. <laughs> uh, I don't know which way is up. Uh, <laughs> I, I think actually, like, the trick is really to really, you know, almost the way out is also the way in. And that I really just tried to it, it actually it 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 goes it, it they're saying there'd be moments of intensity and 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 heaviness. Um, but really the whole like start to finish, I'm really just resetting myself over and over and over again in order to do right by the next line. Um and so the same way I get in there is this is the same way I get out uh which is just to you know to disappear uh to not approach it like oh look what I just did <laughs> you know what I mean but to just let it go and uh and then be open to the next uh what it, whatever the next kind of uh a cognitive task, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um and, and and so that it actually it's I I I I experience it. I it is it is heavy for me, but it's not permanent. It doesn't feel permanent. Every little place I go in the course of a poem feels fleeting. And actually it's almost over before the next little line uh begins. <laughs> Yeah, I, I sort of uh, have the sense that being a being the physicality helps um, respond to like those um, that weight and violence that we're talking about. So, I mean, um, I don't memorize anything. I I uh, I'm not good at it, uh, but being free in that way, I, I think probably, I would guess is, is a way to deal with that. Yeah. Um, here's a question here for all three of you. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked, um, since we're at the Eastside Freedom Library, I wonder if each of you would be willing to speak to the importance of libraries in your life, communities or writing practices, uh, or uh, since the East Side Freedom Library is founded by academics, uh, it's founded by the community. Everything in here, there's a lot of stuff in here. Almost all of it was given to us. And the stuff that happens here happens because people come to us. But it is true, our co-founders uh, are uh, former professors. Um, uh, uh, and uh, each of you has advanced degrees. I wonder if you would speak uh, to your hopes to see poetry continue to thrive outside of the ac academic spaces. And I think you talked a little bit or hinted at that a little bit, you know, you're talking about um, how, uh, regardless to our identity, often we find ourselves in spaces that perpetuate that empire, that colonization. Um, but, you know, maybe taking poetry outside of the academy, but also putting community and real life and the real narrative of this world into the academy and the treacheries of that. Well, I, <laughs> for most of my life, I thought libraries were places where you checked out books and videos. Uh, and a few years ago, I was the the poet laureate of the Anoka County Library System. When I met Tongo for the first time, we were talking to Crystal Wilkinson, and she's a poet laureate of Kentucky, and Tongo's a poet laureate of San Francisco, and I was the poet laureate of the Anoka County Libraries. But I was just like, hey, we're all sharing the message of poetry, just different 
and from different elevations. But through that work, I, I understood uh, emotionally something that I, I think I also kind of understood intellectually, but didn't really grasp, um, which is that librarians are um, vital, engaged community activists. They provide so many resources, housing, um, information, uh, access to computers. Uh, there's a reason why librarians are under attack uh, today, and it's because the work that they do is that important. Um, they they help people connect uh, to to information, to opportunities, to community in ways that are hard to replicate in other spaces. Um, I, I, I as I said, I was. I thought of libraries as a place where you checked out books and did research and that kind of a thing. And libraries were a huge part of um, how I would spend time growing up, checking out books, trying to read the most during the summer to get a little certificate and that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, I love libraries. I love their mission. They're important um, for, for the community and for the people in the community. Well, I, uh, as a, daughter of immigrants and a latchkey kid most of my childhood was spent in a library you know couldn't go home really because my parents weren't home yet and so after school my brother and I would take the bus the late school bus whatever to the, uh, the town's library and I didn't really study there <laughs> I uh, maybe hung out and uh, with some friends and uh, I don't know anyway but um, no it was a vital place uh, it was a it was a place of sort of a shelter and protection and um, a place to explore, just to like wander and um, yeah, so libraries are amazing. And I just, I realize now after hearing you that to be a librarian is also, to, is a form of activism, I think in this world. And um, I think activism comes in a lot of ways, like takes different forms. And um, in the, I don't know, it's just, it's just to act, you know, to, to do something uh, to make a difference. Um, and um, what was the other question? Uh, that was like a two part. Oh, outside, right. Um, yeah, I think uh, poetry is um, is music. It's 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 a way for us to connect and um, and tell our stories. And I think um, I have a lot of beef with the academic world, and um, I won't bore anyone here with that. But um, I think it needs to be egalitarian. I mean, it, everyone should have access. Everyone's a poet. Um, I don't know. So yeah. So I mean, we all work in prisons, and um, so and um, yeah. I think poetry should be everywhere. So yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that poetry is music, and. Um, Tonight is full of music, and I, I think that is, I, I started to understand and appreciate poetry when I viewed it that way, as as music, and uh, we have a friend of the library musician who doesn't like using the word jazz, but it's like, that's what I, that's what I heard tonight, and um, just remembering that, and, and jazz is an American thing, and it's American because of who brought it. And so that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, jazz is the music of black people, um, the diaspora. And that's true in this country. It's true in the Latin countries. It's true now all over the world because the soundtrack, you know, is, is made out of that. So um, I don't know, uh, anyone... I don't see any hands here um, because these are great questions. Um, seriously, uh, I, I want to give uh, people a chance. So I'm going to go to I'm going to skip to questions that are were asked by people who haven't had a chance yet. Um, Trish Zimmerman says, I notice, I think differently when I listen to poetry, tonight no exception, I, uh, I experience the world a little more raw and hear, hear its words and its joys more accurately. Why? Uh, 
what's poetry um uh let's see why does poetry do that in ways that other um other ways of communicating can't i have to say i was thinking about the same thing earlier tonga when you were talking about um the the ways that poetry can allow us to think differently about the conditions of our society of our societies of our cities of our world um there's so many forms of media social media and within that all those different variations there's print media and news television media and <clears throat> the media that we don't always recognize as media but the, there's constant messaging and programming that we receive and the question becomes how do you break through that um poems have the ability to do that on the page they're portable a message you receive in a poem is something that you can carry around with you um I think most people can think of a poem that just matters to them in a significant way. And then there are nights like tonight where we gather, it's dark and cold, and um, we hear messages in a different way. I, I won't remember tweets I saw last week. Um, I won't remember news stories I read a month ago. Um, but I remember tonight for years, right? Because um, in addition to the topics that are shared, there's there's how they're shared. Sue is fully present in her work. I try to be. Tongo is as well. And there's something about that authenticity. Um, I think about John Mario, who said that in, in in his first book, he thought about audience, and in the second book, he thought about listener. There's something about that um, connection, that closeness. Um, you you can you can tell that the artist is fully present in the work that they're making, and I think that that radiates in a way that you can't du duplicate in other settings. I don't feel like that's unique to poetry. I do feel like it's something art does extremely well. It could be. Uh, a musician, for that matter, but you can tell that they're they're serious, that they're invested in it, that they're present in it, and there's something that about that that commands us as listeners to come forward and and be connected to that too. Um, that sort of segues into another question. Um, so we've sort of uh, talked about this. Uh, T. Riate Medina asks uh, Tango, uh, beyond being poet laureate, you play guitar, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, often perform with musicians. Can you speak more about how music and poetry are embraced and elevated uh, in your craft, specifically revolutionary music? Is the guitar here right now? <laughs> 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 the guitar is never here <laughs> and never will be <laughs> um man you know it's it's uh it's really interesting working with musicians um when uh when it really when when uh if the objective becomes just to communicate with each other on a stage uh it's almost like the individual expression of lines and notes almost kind of or or as lines and notes as the final presentation actually dissolves and it really just becomes a presentation of energy in a way that almost gives you the feeling that both lines and notes extend from the same kind of energy and 
I think that's like back to the the kind of like the power of poetry or why poetry can feel like thinking different because when you're dealing with kind of when you're almost like intellectual, I don't know the exact verb, but when you kind of, when you create almost these, these little statues of a stanza, right? like you create these little um, statues that extend from the natural shapes of your mind, the natural shapes of how it moves, not the ones that are encouraged by the the ruling class, <laughs> not those that 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 are encouraged or that you begin to mimic in order to uh, get along with this hegemony. Um, there's that liberatory. Um, there's that liberatory power in that you get you come to see that within you and the way your mind naturally moves, there is all of the secrets of the universe that we are told only get uh, only get translated, only get observed through white supremacist ideals, <laughs> right? And, you know, accompanied, I think, you know, in, in working, in working with music, you really get that you, you, it becomes even more, it becomes even more visceral. It becomes even more um, amplified if, if you, if you all are really communicating. Um, but ultimately, I think like you know, I will never, man. The guitar is never coming. The guitar is is never coming out. What it what it taught me though, or is teaching me, is uh, just kind of the. Uh, it it just gives me more of a sense of of kind of the uh, like. Almost like the natural math uh, of the phenomenal universe and how math actually communicates through um, uh, pleasing sounds, you know what I mean? Or how beautiful, right? Uh, how beautiful raw dialogue can be with uh, can can be with reality. Um, and, you know, I, again, I, I think this is cousin to what to what poetry does. Man, this hypnotherapist inadvertently gave me some great advice as I was being uh, what they what they, what they call I was being snarky. I was like, you hypnotize people. <laughs> and sh she said, no. She said, I hypnotize myself. I put myself in a trance and they are pulled into that gravity, right? Similarly, a poet is putting themselves in this way of going about reality, resting on your natural your internal shapes, right? Resting on the supremacy of you, and your people and your family, right? And that process pulls the um, the listener in, pulls the pulls the reader in, and they then can uh, start to mirror not necessarily your thought, but the way you're going about excavating um, thoughts. And I think that's why there's almost like an instant, like it's like waking up. And it has an enormous, like, liberatory consequence, you know. I always have to relate this, you know. Umar Ben Hassan of the Last Poets, my one of my favorite poets, you know, he was quite the knucklehead. When he, <laughs> and I asked him what put you on this political path, a political path, path of, of craft. And he said, man, I, I heard a poem. I heard a Mary Baraka poem in it. I was just... It, it 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 changed me talking to my own uh, my mother about her um her her praxis 
and she uh she relates how um a Diane uh De Prima poem kind of changed her praxis to a more, you know, to to lean more into women's liberation. Um, so it's like there's something, you know, there's almost in if we if we successfully re uh, reside in that kind of portal or that opening away from convention and into, you know, our natural power, it's like somebody sees you operating there and it's just like, oh, it's also like it's inspiring, but then it also puts you puts them in tune with their nature and what's really going on inside them and what they can do with it. Like, I don't know, man, you know, I just heard a poem and I just started, lines just started popping in my head. It wasn't, you know, it's an instant process, you know? Um, uh, one of uh, the library's co-founders uh, commented, uh, this conversation is so apt because right behind you is the collection of Fred Ho, who was an amazing activist, but a musician as well. And there's a picture somewhere in this vicinity of him uh, all green with, I think it's a bass saxophone or something like that. I, I don't know. I failed music appreciation in college. So uh, seriously, attitude how <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I, I i explain it to my students it's it's a not just a cautionary tale but um anyway uh, <laughs> but in uh, marion mcclinton's books are I, I think back here too the the um director who worked a lot with august wilson right above us is the work of uh leon wong uh there is a poster uh, that references Attica. It has a typewriter in it. Speaking of instruments, the typewriter is the percussion instrument of poetry. So if you want a typewriter, you should get one. Um, but there are a lot of other things here too. Uh, there is a lot of artwork in, in this in this space. Uh, again, all of it was given to us because people in the community far and wide want to fill this space with good things besides the 35,000 books or maybe it's more now, it grows every day. Um, uh, the person who has made sure they're all in the right places sitting in the back of the room here. So uh, yeah, um, hi, David. We're almost out of time, um, if, if that's a, a thing. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, I, I wanna make sure that we got to all the people, if not all the questions. Uh, Tango, are you familiar with the Bird and Beckett Bookstore? In San Francisco? Absolutely, man. Okay. Shout out to Eric. All right. Who, who runs it, man? All right, cool. Um, <laughs> Whenever in San Francisco, you should go. Okay. That's actually where Bird and Beckett actually were my first book. Someone's dead already. The book release was actually in Bird and Beckett. All right. Yeah. And, and I actually, you know, he does these. Uh, great jazz nights nice, where basically like there, there, there's actually an, a kind of stage similar this is bigger but like the bookshelves reveal when move that it's actually there's actually a stage in there and they have really good live shows i would so tune in <laughs> all right and go to the buried and Beckett website yeah yes Yes. I'll, I'll I don't that. I, 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 what yeah what do you all do for fun i, I don't know is that, is, I, is that I, do, I, what's I, get I to have fun i don't Better. do anything for uh, i mean something I, I watch a lot of astrology videos right now i uh, the last two years i've taken a online ancient hellenistic astrology course uh, <laughs> and you said strategist like when I, you introduced me but i had yeah, but I really have stargazer because I like to look at. So that's Sorry. kind of my fun, like sort of side hobby right now. I will eat a cookie, <laughs> you know. I like to, I like to have dinner at Sue's house, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like to, I like to, I like to go swimming. And is, and is writing a book about swimming. Oh. Yeah. This, sorry. I mean, the reason why I don't get nervous is because I know I'm going to screw up and it's like, I'm old enough. So it's like, eh, whatever, you know, I'm going to mess this up. Uh, so Clarence, I know we're, we're near the end of time. Yeah. I, 
I wanted to just uh, reflecting back on something you shared earlier and talking about um, it's either the work of slavery or it's the work of liberation. And as you were talking and sharing ideas on it, I just found myself thinking so much that the first liberatory act has to be to liberate the self, uh, which is connected to thinking about um, our own relationship to uh, capitalist structures and uh, the ways that hegemony shapes like all the things that we do. Um, I don't know that I have a question in here. I just wanted to depart by carrying forward how important it is for us as individuals, as artists, as community members, um, to just think about our relationship to all the, the structures that ultimately are bent on our destruction or silence or cancellation or however you want to think about it all. Yeah, yeah, and the the, the groovy news um uh, concerning the poets is you know Ferre actually argued that the um the beginning of your reabsorption of your social power because that's another way of looking at what revolution is, right? It's just when we take back our all the various social powers that we have you know, uh, allowed ourselves to be alienated from um, the beginning is the naming of the world. And so, you know, that's a good, uh, nonviolent, <laughs> easy to pull off uh, exercise, right? For us to name the world ourselves, the name was going on to define ourselves, again, outside of ruling class, prescription yeah uh thank you um i want to say one more time uh on wednesday december 28th uh teach-in um <clears throat> so uh keep that in mind um again subtext books thank you thank you as always uh there are a lot of other things coming up in the new year uh, we had decided not to add anything to the december calendar because we have way too much going on here um but we made space for this and i'm glad we did and i'm glad that everybody uh joined us for that um and uh for the folks who are here drive carefully get home safely thank you for coming uh, to the folks who are watching uh, online, thank you for joining us. Uh, it would have been great to see you and uh, next time uh, when it maybe when it's warmer, uh, you can be here or on our lawn. Um, I think you're coming back in February. Maybe there will be some things happening there. It will. It will. <laughs> It will. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, March, maybe we should, maybe we should push back to March. You, you realize people uh, play football in this weather, you know. Yeah. Not, so, not so honest. how dare we complain? <laughs> <laughs> back in the days when those guys didn't make that much money, but yeah, they still. It's technically, well, some, a lot of them really don't make that much money now. February it is, man. <laughs> I've been inspired. <laughs> but for all of us at the Eastside Freedom Library, uh, thank you um, for joining us. And we will see you soon, hopefully. Um, good night.